um, screen, etc. Or yes, it's shared. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Let's see just, if it's working properly. Just. Well, go on screen sharing. You see my screen? Yeah, we, we can see your screen. Yeah. Perfect. And let us see if the slides are changing. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I think uh, <clears throat> time to begin. So, uh, welcome everybody to this afternoon session of the third day of this uh, very informating and exciting meeting, quantum information and quantum technology. And the speaker we have is uh, Philip uh, Walter. I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him here. So Philip did his uh, PhD in 2005 with Anson Zeilinger at University of Vienna. After that, uh, I think he went for a postdoc to Harvard and then came back and joined University of Vienna and he set up his own group there. He has been there ever since. And he has been now doing very state of the art experiments on photonics. I mean, if I start uh, recounting uh, very nice works, it wouldn't take a lot of time here. I'll just give you uh, some snapshot, a experimental one-way quantum computing, then de Broglie wavelength of uh, four photon state. I wouldn't have even thought that there is a de Broglie wavelength of a four photon no, non-local state. Then sim quantum uh, simulation of a spin glass. How does a wave function of a spin glass behave and so on. So a lot of other things. So, uh, I think we are very fortunate that a person like him, we get to hear here. So I think uh, it's better not to stand in the way of the audience and the speaker. So Philip, so stage is all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. Um, as, as, as you heard, I work, on, uh, work with quantum photonics and we try to develop these technologies for, for realizing quantum computers, quantum simulators, um, and, and on the way to basically increase the size and get better and better, we like to look to the left and right and to find new twists, to develop new applications and show what else can be done uh, with, with um, quantum platforms that might not be that big yet, but still pretty powerful in their, basically with their, already small size capabilities. Good. Therefore, I've chosen the title Photonic Quantum Computing with a bright future for many applications because in my eyes, there might be many interesting things probably spinning off just now um, that uh, we have that on the radar and might be way more interesting than what we have thought five years ago as the typical applications for quantum computing. Good. Coming from Austria, let me, how can I now? Coming to Austria, uh, coming from Austria, um, I like to show this quotation. So, I'd like to get a pointer here. Yes. So, I like to show this quotation which says, "We never experiment with just one electron or atom, or in my case, my case, single photons." And in thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do. This invariably entails ridiculous consequences. We are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise each to solve in the zoo. So, as you, as you can read here. Um, this basically quotation says that it will be impossible to ever play with single atoms, single photons, and so on. So, does someone has any idea who could have said that? Well, in the audience, easier to get feedback, it's maybe a little harder. Coming from Austria, the hint is already there. It's Evan Schrödinger. And as you see in the years, 1952, actually, it's towards the end of his time. When he at still that time still thought we will never play with single atoms, single photons. And this has changed. We had a dramatic improvement. And now we really face the so-called second quantum revolution, where you all basically are part of it, which is exciting. 
that we manage to play with individual ion C and ion traps or atoms and optical lattices or superconducting circuits, or in my case, with single photons, that we can really study quantum phenomena and use it for new technology. And that's exciting. And I think it's a, it's a beautiful time for physicists, physicists to see uh, where we go. So let's do with photons because this is my business field. And here I, I want to emphasize that photons um, are a very rich system in the sense you can use them for so many applications. So they're a natural choice for communication because they fly at the speed of light. The only way to transfer is the quantum information, quantum states. Um, they have been since the early days used as the pioneering system to study quantum entanglement, superposition, because it was rather the only way to get it at that time by this, for example, not in the crystal, where you get these entangled photon pairs by proper alignment of this, um, this, 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 this way. There also natural choice of metrology because we need light to measure something. And if you use quantum light or quantum interference, you can also be better than what lasers can achieve. So you can surpass the so-called classical shot noise limit and reach the Heisenberg limit. And also for these photons are the way to go. Uh, and now for the last, so what's in the, what's in the most modern trend and developed 20 years ago is the computation part that it was shown that single photons actually can also be computers. And the challenge is to make gates for photon interact to implement so-called two qubit gates. And here you see already indicated that the measurement process is important because the measurement allows to basically move on the information in the systems by interfering them with other photons. We we'll come to that in a second later how this goes. The other thing that's nice is uh, encoding information. So photons have internal degrees of freedom like polarization. So you can choose one polarization, let's say this one here, is horizontal polarization as a zero state. The orthogonal polarization is one. You can easily separate those by optical elements, that's no problem. But you can also turn one to the other by using a phase retarder that puts you to any point on the uh, polarization sphere. And if you see to the, if you take a look to the Bloch sphere here, they're identical. So polarization for me is the same as, as, a, as a spin one half Bloch sphere, and easily can be addressed and also implemented. And these are the plates basically that change the polarization state as you want from, for example, this H state to superposition of H plus one. But you can also use uh, the location. You can also take paths the photons travel as shown here, and prepare superpositions that the photon is delocalized among those two paths which is then path encoding, also very often used for technical reasons that uh, because these paths are easy to realize on chips with fibers. And you see this polarizing beam split, which, which just says you can map between polarization encoding and path encoding where the polarization beam splitter here transmits one polarization, but reflects the other, such as the single photon here is the map to the superposition of modes, if you want. But normally it just stay in the path degree of freedom or polarization degree of freedom. Um, if you're asking about where are we now, then I can show you a cover of The Economist, the famous business magazine from actually seven years ago, where it shows that the race for the quantum computer is still open. It's a head-to-head -head race between, as shown in this cartoon, between photons, um, superconductor circuits, and ions. Okay, and here you see the racing cars, and I think it hasn't changed since then. And that's so exciting because in my eyes, there is no um, uh, leading figure in the sense of that's the way to go. Every system faces challenging. Everywhere are dramatic improvements. You wait a month, another system is ahead. You wait another month, and again, another system is ahead. So um, it's, it's interesting science that happens. And it's, in my eyes, totally not clear who will be the winner, or even if the design is already clear, but at the end will be the, the best configuration. And as indicated here, all the companies right now enter this business. Good, but what's a quantum computer with photons? How does it look like? In essence, you need just three parts. We need the source to generate the single photon states, which in turn turns out to be the hardest part. Nature fights so hard to give us single photons that this is really the limiting factor. Then comes the, the processor where single photons are processed. You see the antigen modes, and then they can, it's basically where they meet, there's a beam splitter, they can meet each other, they can interfere, they can superimpose the paths and so on, and you can control them. We're changing the path lengths here with these phase shifters. So that's a processor. And here we benefit from the last 20 years where technology allows the dramatic improvements in such 
integrated circuits that are, that are not bigger than my fingernail size, but allow to process many proteins. And at the end, we need detectors, which just allow to have um, the best collection efficiency and detection efficiency, because when it's hard to get photons, you don't want to lose them here. So we need also high transmission rates here, but you also don't want to lose them at the end when just detecting them where they come out of the waveguide and give you the answer of your computation. So back to the source, we want photons that are ideal in the sense they're pure, so there's no noise contribution. There's also no, no basically no extra photon. You just want one photon and not two photons and so on. And you want it on demand. Ideally, you want to push a button and somewhere photons jump out. And this is extremely hard to get. So, so far, the most popular source is based on a probabilistic event, so-called spontaneous parametric down conversion, where a laser penetrates here this uh, nonlinear crystal, it's kind of like so-called Chi2 crystal, where randomly photon pairs are emitted, so one blue becomes two red photons, energy must be preserved, and momentum as well. That, for example, when you do it well, these photons are either can be entangled or just separate, basically single photon states. But the limiting factor is here, so the good thing is it's easy. But the limiting fact is it's random, so you never know when this is happening. And you have noise that sometimes two pairs are coming. So you actually have sometimes more than one photons being involved. So on the other hand, there's no dramatic improvement with um, artificial atoms or so-called quantum dots, where you take a small pillar, the same like the industry, and when you now shine a laser light, then every time you can excite an electron to go up and down and thus emit an single photon. So basically a laser every time when it hits the, the pillar here, this the artificial atom, so it's called artificial atom because it behaves like a single atom, and you get the photon out. That's perfect. It's in principle deterministic. The challenge now is to catch this photon to be at the end in a fiber. So people therefore build cavities and then use filtering steps and collection mechanisms to get the single photon from here to there. So at the moment there's a technical reason, another fundamental reason, that these sources are not deterministic yet because the quality limits the, basically how often you catch the photon. And of course, you can imagine it's very hard to get 50, 60, 70% efficiency to catch a random limited photon by a cavity and collection mechanisms into a fiber. However, there's, con there's continuous improvements. And here you see an artificial, sorry, a commercial source because this is such a trend, this quantum dots nowadays, you can even buy it from, for example, from this French company. And you see such a source in a cryostat, the one is cold because then they have better qualities for the, for the light in a cryostat. And that's the new trend to grow. So if you now ask, how can you make microphoton states? Well, in the standard case with down conversion, you take several sources at the same time, and then right, you basically shoot through the same time. But then it's, of course, a small probability that both. Um, sources emit at the same time. So if the emission rate is 1% from the first and 1% from the other, then it's 1% times 1% to get this four photon state. And that's the reason that accounts are really small and low for having five pairs, six pairs. And actually, the limit these days is really 10 photons. Maybe when you have active routing and active technology, maybe 40, but that's really like theory numbers. You're more likely in this regime. In contrast, when you just have one quantum dot source, where the photons come one after the other, Okay, with very high probability, then you can delay the first to meet the second, and then to delay the first and second with the, with the third by optical paths, that you get at the end this kind of array of having photons simultaneously, which you need, because they must meet and be able to interfere to be processed on the chip. And here already, in standard optics, you reach easily 20 photons. That means photons per second. That's roughly my the figure of merit here. How many photons can it produce per second? And if you be basically um, proactive with active switches and so on, then you can boost these numbers way ahead to 60, 80, maybe 100. And we'll show you later that we don't need more photons because um, producing this kind of 80 to 100 photons at a time is sufficient for universal computing, which I'll show basically a bit later of the talk. Good. Um, detection. So, of course, you don't want to lose photons at the end. So, the best detection units right now are using superconducting technology, where you cool down a nanowire, as shown here, and you measure the resistance. There is, of course, no resistance if it's a superconductor. You put them in a cryostat, the photons can enter by fiber. So, that's you know, the detector. 
And if the photon hits the nanowires, it creates a so-called hotspot. It changes the material such, such that it does not, uh, is not be superconducting anymore. So you see the current here um, is, is, is interrupted. You see a change in resistivity that you can measure that gives you the click. And since it's a small material only, it gets cold quickly again, and then it can see the next photon. That's basically the mechanism for these detectors based on superconductors. And they really have very high efficiency of 95%, which is what you want to be at the end scalable with quantum photonics. Here, a picture from our lab. So here you see the fibers entering um, the cryostat. Also, those want it cold because superconductors like also helium, so liquid helium temperatures, they go down all the way to the, to the bottom of the cryostat where they find this detector. Fiber comes in. Here, particular detectors where we actually put four of them in one spot. So there's four output signals possible, which allows to distinguish when two photons come, for example, then maybe one detector fires for the first and the other detector here for the second. This allows to distinguish photon numbers um, in our labs. Good, you have sources, you have detectors, now we need the chip. So it became popular now for stability reasons and basically for also facing that we will have many components in the future to regulate integrated optics where you take laser as well as you take glass and then you prepare waveguides where light can travel. And if they meet here, they can interact. For example, mode here can go afterwards to mode C and D and be recombined and come out. And that's a so-called Marzen the interferometry where this all together acts like, acts like a tunable beam splitter where you change the tunability by uh, basically heating up here such that the path gets longer or shorter such that at the end can really tune how much light ends up in this mode or in that mode at the end. So in essence, you have such a scenario here where the light here then goes to um, these two modes at the end, dependent on the setting here. We use path encoding, that's state zero, that's state one, and then you can prepare the state the superstitions at the end, the tuning just as little phase shifters. And the, the benefit is they're very robust and very reliable and also have static noise. There's no dynamic noise, atom space, but fluctuations with the environment. That's really very nice in such a system. Um, now you can put several of those together, then it looks like this, that you have not many modes coming in. Each of those squares, or, or, yeah, basically squares here corresponds to one of those previous Marzenders. And now we're putting all those together and tuning always the phase shift. You can really implement unitary evolution from the input to the output. It's not universal. You can't generate entanglement on purpose, but it's a very powerful interferometric network that allows important subroutines that still use quantum enhancement for doing things better. And I will show you a few in the future, like boson sampling or, or even some search algorithms, machine learning tasks that just benefit from such an interferometric network where one or several photons are processed. So in reality, the chip looks actually more like this. This is uh, five millimeters long. The chip that we get from MIT, I think so far is still the most, the biggest chip available for single photons. Where here, the, you see the modes coming in. And then here, everywhere you have this little Marzena structure. So let's zoom in. So if here, the modes come together for the first beam splitter. Here's the second beam splitter. And here you can change by heaters locally the length change of the material. It effectively gives you a phase change here and there allowing you to implement arbitrary uh, small unitaries for each of those elements and all those unitaries together, you find a big unitary of the system. And we are privileged that we get this kind of chip from our collaborators in MIT um, that manufacture those chips and we can really show interesting physics with them. Good, but it's a school and I'll just talk about how to generate the universal quantum computing um, uh, platform. And for that, we need something in addition. So what we need here is um, for universal quantum computing, also a gate, so-called two-photon gate, that allows to produce entanglement. So if you, for example, take this little circuit here, we have start, so this is basically a computer scientist who draw it. You start with an input state, zero for this qubit, that qubit, and this qubit. If the first qubit is rotated by Hadamard operations, I um, apologize, we're not going to details here, but it's just a single qubit operation. And then apply these entangled operations, and they can produce this highly entangled GHC state. So the magic here happens with this um, two qubit controlled NOT gate, 
where if you, for example, use polarization and code it to qubits, then the first qubit defines the state of the second qubit. So if the first qubit is H, nothing happens to the second qubit. If it's in the polarization state V, then it flips the target qubit to become also V. And you can also work with coherent superpositions and therefore generate entangled states or read out them as well as step analyzing. What's the difficulty? Well, they are hard. This is very hard to do for photons, whereas this is super easy, but just using weight plates as I've shown before. So how do you get those two qubit gates? And there are a few ways to do it. I would say that the, the first way to do it is just by, it was basically the first way how it was done was shown by optical interference, where you take single photons coming into this network. I don't show the details here about the inside the beam splitters and so on, but here you, you use a network and you design it in such a way that when one photon comes out here and the other photon comes out there, then this basically gives you an entangled, basically a scenic operation. What's the downside? The downside is well, it works very unlikely. It's just 11% success rate. And moreover, if you measure at the end, then the photons are gone. Okay, so you can't continue with another uh, scenic afterwards if you have in mind to have more complex algorithms. So therefore, what you can do? Well, people realized there was the breakthrough that photons are scalable architectures. Now, when you add extra photons, so so-called ancilla photons, and let interfere them with the in basically the input photons that basically find this operation here, then you can build a device that by measuring just ancilla photons, you basically undergo this controlled knot operation, such that when you measure here, you know it happened. And here, these output ports uh, are the photons coming out, undergoing the C node operation. That's nice. It also improves the success rate, but what's the downside is? The downside is you need way more photons, okay? And as you see, as I mentioned before, that it's hard to generate single photons. You face a challenge that these gates require extra photons um, to make them happen. And here I've shown a couple of years ago uh, such a little C node gate using integrated optics um, in our labs in Vienna. So let me summarize um, what's needed for scaling of how quantum computer platforms might look like. So the, the, the obvious model now that I just mentioned with these gates, where you basically boost the gate efficiency with ancillary photons, is the, was the, it's the old, was the old style model, so called circuit model, which shows that it's principle possible, but very hard, because you would need hundreds of thousands extra photons to make such basically processing happening where you always measure for each gate extra photons. Um, another architecture came up that I will discuss in a second based on cluster states, highly entangled resource states, where you just process information by measurements, which are way more attractive for photons because they allow for extremely elegant uh, blueprints and designs for photonic quantum computer. And this is what we discussed in a second. Um, in addition, where depending on how much time we'll have, we'll also show that we can also build particular purpose quantum computers just relying on networks like this. They're not universal, but still very powerful and allow even with very um, elegant designs, superior performances, where in fact, the best performance for quantum computing was so far shown in photons is just relying on such networks. And I will hopefully show you this also towards the end of my talk. Good, so for the understanding the blueprint of photons, I have to give you a brief, uh, say a quick introduction to measurement-based quantum computing, which is a concept of quantum computing developed 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago by Haus, Luke, and Briegel, which goes in the following way. The idea is that you basically do not build gates anymore. You rather do the opposite. You start with the entangled resource state, and that's almost sufficient for computing. And I'll show you how it comes. So you start with qubits that not entangled, qubits here in a superposition of zero plus one, and then you apply the entangling operation that every neighbor is entangled. That's the hard part. And in fact, actually it's as hard in theory as implementing the circuits for computing. But in principle, if you apply always the same entangling operation, this is so-called controlled phase gate. This is important, but this is not important as a detail. Then you get the cluster state. And now, uh, they're defined by these kind of stabilizers and they're very, very elegant entangled states because they're easy to characterize, um, allowed to be basically also flexible in terms of the arrangements um, and, and basically a, a really an interesting system on its own. Then you 
design your cluster state by knocking out qubits you don't want and show in a second why this is needed by making measurements on a particular basis. And then you perform the computation by measuring one qubit after the other. Basically, each qubit measurement here effectively transfers the encoded information of this qubit to the next one and adapts basically its state. So by that, you teleport, so to say, to the neighbored qubit. And this effectively introduces here one qubit operations. So now you see the bounds here. And these bonds here actually um, are very important because the bonds between this line and that line of basically sharing this entanglement effectively gives you two qubit gates. So this one here effectively allows to have a C naught gate between this qubit and that qubit. And all these ingredients, basically measurements here along this line and the connections to other lines when you measure over time effectively allows to implement all kinds of circuits you want to do. And that's the idea of measurement based computation. You measure the qubits um, in a particular basis, there are rules how to do it. And this allows at the end to obtain a result of a computation that can be understood by single qubit operations and where we have those bonds. You would like to have those for two qubit gates in between. Um, and then just get the output. So slightly more detail here. So the measurement that you do is in this kind of basis spanned by zero and one, and you choose the phase here, as you choose the basis angle by this, by this angle alpha. So it can be either zero or pi or any other basically orientation between the x, y plane of the block sphere. And if you make a measurement, then you actually rotate your qubit and implement the Hadamard such that the next qubit undergoes this operation. So in my words in, in, in the cartoon, you make a mesh, so there's a three qubit cluster state. You make a measurement here, base alpha. And then basically, you, this guy's teleport over there, at rotate, being rotated by the alpha you've chosen. That's this amount, followed by the hard amount. And of course, now comes quantum mechanics. You can have one outcome or the orthogonal outcome when you make a measurement in the basis. So depending on what you get, you have to, by classical communication, adjust this measurement setting to basically a new angle. So this classical communication is needed to have information not being processed faster than speed of light. And that's the only thing I want to mention here. And this basically details on the, on the side. So to summarize, how does this computation work? You take qubits, you entangle them, that's the hard part. You make measurements according to what you have in mind to do. And then this is the rules that basically would go a bit too far now, but it allows in principle to have a perfect quantum computer. So let's go back to technology. So what's basically what's basically um, what basically we should we should um, 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 so I just read the chat. So basically, what we need for a photonic quantum computer. So in essence, we want to have such a cluster state, and everything else is just measurements which are easy to do. That don't don't bother us. Okay. Of course, there's some feed forward and classical correction, but that's very easy compared to the challenge of making cluster state. So now let's go back to two qubit gates. If you just think about the old standard two qubit gate scenario, then we have the limiting factor of efficiency. You know, we have to add on cylinders and, and, and so on to get it to work. But it turned out that for just fusing these clusters, they're actually a bit more efficient. So let's take an example. Um, so if you would like to fuse neighbor to say have these three and that three qubits would like to fuse them here. Then in the middle is optical elements where one photon comes from here, one photon comes from there. And the 50% chance to go to different output modes. And if this happens, I fuse them. So let's take an example, three photons here, three photons there, I fuse them. Then I'd be left with a four qubit state. Of course, I lose two because I have to measure two photons, but the remaining one has, is a little bigger than the input states. So it can grow slowly in that direction. But 50% success rate is really better than the previous CNOT gates, but it's not successful in the big picture if you fail always half of the time, because one half times one half times one half gives you at the end basically zero success rate. But if you use the same trick as before to add on silver photons, that turns out you can boost easily this fusion to 75% by having either four extra photons or two entangled pairs. And they look like this, this kind of fusion case. And now the magic happens. It turns out that when the static point 
as shown here, five qubit cluster states are, and you have just 50% success rate. Okay, very basic, 50% success rate. It turned out that you will always find connections that go from the very beginning to the end. So what you want is by no means you want to have a broken connection from the beginning to the end, okay? As long as the first qubit is somewhere entangled with the last qubit, even if there are different paths than original plant involved, it doesn't matter because then you make other measurements that basically get you there. But the golden rule is you want to have a connection from the beginning to the end. And it turned out, surprisingly, that the 50% success rate, you find mathematically a solution that you always basically find some more paths going to the end. And since you know where gate failed, you know exactly which qubits are connected and you can just adjust this in your program. But five qubits is not an easy starting point still. Can we do better? Yes, it was then shown that actually when you have three qubits only, you can't be smaller than this, three qubits, and you manage to have success rate of 75% to diffusion gate, then basically as you see here, this is a success rate versus um, can we connect till the end? One is yes, and zero is no. You can see at this 75% is the limit, and now it has even improved the, the threshold that you can really go till the end. So in other words, just three qubits and 75% success of the gates with optics, no magic, yeah? just, just basically monitoring where the gate work allows you to go to arbitrary big cluster states. And now to conclude here, because I guess it's a lot of information in a short time, this is the summary for the blueprint of the photonic quantum computer at the moment, a universal quantum computer I want to emphasize, universal one, okay? That you work in a measurement-based scheme and you just need to generate three photon GC states on demand. So actually the hardest part for photonic quantum computing is the first step, this one here, where you start with perfect, pure, on-demand existing free photon sheet C states because everything else can be done with probabilistic fusion gates and it can be done with just passive optics, no complicated active switching, just passive delays and so on to really end up in a cluster state that you measure also uh, in a rather straightforward way. And this actually turns out to be super hard uh, to generate free photons in a, in a, in a reliable way. Um, I invite you all to think about schemes, methods. If you find an interesting scheme, it immediately pays off that you become either rich by founding a company or very well cited in the field because these are the open questions for scaling up for the photonic quantum computers, the first step. Um, and the blueprint in a more sketchy way looks like this. So you get magically these three photon sheet C states, you apply them, um, these kind of fusion gates that basically get some with works and will not work, and then you get this percolated cluster. That means the cluster basically, the bonds percolate through, they're not always straight, but some of them manage to wind themselves till the end. And then when you know, because you know how the cluster looks like, you make these measurements according to the measurement based quantum computing. And as you see, that's a dynamic process of photons being generated, being entangled, measured, and then new photons come in to be entangled with those that are still in the, in the, in the building block you see that the number of photons that we need at the same time is not the entire size of the computation. It can be much smaller, namely to 100 photons maybe, or a bit more, that they, they, that they build the active zone. So like a typing machine, basically photons come in, then they'll be processed, results come out, and basically while this happens, you always feed in new, basically blocks of photon, which um, is, the, is basically the concept of such photonic quantum computers. Actually, uh, this, this, this blueprint is so exciting that at the moment, one of the biggest companies for, photonic, for, for, for quantum computing dedicates its effort for photonic quantum computing, and that's PsyQuantum in Silicon Valley. And they've raised so far a very impressive amount of, I don't know, a few hundred millions um, to dedicate the research really to these blueprints that I've just shown you um, a few slides ago. Good. Um, but back to science. So that's the basically what textbook tells us right now how blueprints uh, look like and what to do. But we're scientists. We want to still investigate left and right what else can be done. And as you've seen, the difficulty is really this photon photon interactions. And therefore, people look at different ways. Of course, the linear optics one is, is, is tempting. You just measure or you have elegant networks. But at the end, you always need more photons. And the question is can we? basically find a way to stay with the photon number 
and just optimize the interactions. And that's the field of nonlinear optics for nonlinear interactions, where beautiful experiments are happening everywhere. So they all rely somehow with, uh, on atoms because with atoms is the medium to interact with light. So the experiments with atoms where light is coupled via cavities, so strong coupling in also called cavity quantum electrodynamics, in cavities or with nanofibers and bottle resonators done many places, Spain, Caltech in the US, Max Planck, MIT, um, where they just optimize the, the strength between light and matter to implement gates, so have two photons interact to each other via atomic media. That's one direction. Beautiful physics, but of course hard to do with all those requirements of cold, cold atoms and cavities and so on. Other directions rely on the artificial atoms and the quantum dots that they try to design such systems to emit actually a string of entangled photon pairs. So the dream is to have a string of entangled GHC states coming out very efficiently, very effectively, that basically would help um, to be the starting point for what I've shown before, this universal quantum computer. And there are exotic programs as well. We consider one here in Vienna where we want to actually want to use graphene, there's a graphene layer here, as a nonlinear material that allows to provide extremely strong linearities that we can basically design beam splitters out of graphene as a beam splitter, that when the photons, which are now plasmons in graphene, because the graphene absorbs the photon and becomes a charge, that when they meet, we change the beam splitter statistics that you have always the right outcome and basically suppress the photon sponge. So basically, but I want to briefly show what we do in Vienna to give a slightly more idea about what's meant here. So nonlinearities are nice, but they're always very weak. So typically they don't care about the units here, but just these numbers are here with respect to it, to show that they respect to each other with the, with the, with the, with the, with the nonlinear strength. So in bicrystals, we have this 10 to minus nine. In graphene, you have already 100 times stronger linearity. And if you design graphene to be like little highways, that when you have an excitation, it can't run away. It must go a different direction and basically go to and meet the other ones. You can boost it again to 10 to minus three. And this can be understood that a photon who has a particular size is it gets absorbed as a plasmon and then it shrinks in each direction by a factor of 1,000. And this allows, of course, to have way stronger fields at the end, give it this non-linearities a colometer action much easier. And we design, therefore, nanoribbons that in case of graphene actually work with this pi 3, not pi 2, unfortunately. And we did some calculations, very straightforward ones, uh, very naive ones, actually, to show that if you build beam splitters like this and you manage to get these plasmas together you can, and take it the lifetimes of plasma that people achieve because they don't live forever, they live a few picoseconds, then you can have extremely high gate efficiency of 99%. That means only 1% failure would be a dream. So a dream of having waveguides at room temperature where you put graphene on top and then enhance uh, these devices to have nonlinear features or basically be more likely to have the right outcome that helps scalability at the end. We made now some of the first steps with graphene to investigate the nonlinearity. We are not at the single photon level yet, but the direction is promising and shows that we really see interesting features of graphene in the, in the, um, there. Good, I see a question coming up. Squeezed light is non-classical light. How we, how we use squeezed states of photonic quantum communication? Um, good, the, the, the different questions. Yes, and so, yes, so that the different ways of non classical light, either Fox state, we can squeeze it, they basically work with the quadratures. Uh, in, in quantum communication, you just work with single photons as information carrier. And you use the squeezing actually for, for normally implementing quantum cryptography. Okay. And you can actually uh, implement different kinds of, of schemes with that. For computing, you can also use squeezing where the nonlinearity come, that the, the quantum mechanical features come from the squeezing. There are beautiful platforms out there. So we're not talking about squeezing actually later on, which I'm a discrete variable guy. Um, but here the squeezing gives you the, the basically the, the quantum feature, but these systems are extremely fragile if it's, if it terms to loss. When you lose, then the squeezing is gone. And therefore it seems at the moment very challenging to keep the amount of squeezing that's needed for showing universal computing, okay? That's squeezing. 
let's go back to let's see the time. Yeah, the time is left. Um, to back to linear optics, where I picked out things where photons have been good or successful. Okay, so if we talk about photonic quantum computing. We must talk about supremacy. Okay, so quantum supremacy is this catchy word that says it's the hunt, or the race for doing a quantum computation that is so hard that no classic machine can basically give the answer or to get the same output. So you really want to outperform a classic machine for actually more like a fundamental interest to prove that there's no limit, that quantum mechanics does not break down when you go to certain performance level, that you will never be able to outperform classic machines. That was the motivation more or less for this race. And this can be, so basically people identified very ideal computations that are not so hard to do, resource efficient. Practically speaking, they're not the most interesting ones, but that's not the point here. The point is you just want to be um, basically efficient in the computation and their photons basically have been the, the first ones showing a path and at the moment also the strongest one in the results. So let me show how this can be done. And we need actually only very basic understanding of photons and interference. So what we need now is a beam splitter with 50% chance to transmit light and 50% chance to reflect light. So when you write down the beam splitter matrix, then you have the amplitudes of being transmitted one half here and being reflected one half. And the reflection gives you this eye phase from this side and eye phase from that side, that's optics. And that's basically what's happening. So now when you look at the photons that be transmitted both, both being reflected, so shown here both transmitted, both reflected, that overall, we'll never see photons ending up in different ports because both transmitted, both reflected become zero because the I and I component, I times I gives you I squared, as shown here, transmission and I squared reflection gives you minus reflection and therefore this becomes zero. And that makes sense because photons are bosons when they can interfere, they want a bunch, and therefore you see always two photons either here or there. But mathematically, what happens when you look at the different output ports, then you calculate the transmission of this and you add it by this term, the reflection. And this operation of transmission plus reflection is the permanent of a matrix. You might know the determinant, which gives you plus, minus, plus, minus. You just have pluses, which photons would do, then you have the permanent. And the permanent, you say, why do we care? Well, the permanent is interesting because it's extremely hard to calculate in contrast to the determinant. It's really like as hard as solving the salesman problem, even hard it says actually how many space solutions exist to such a problem. And technically speaking, it belongs to the class of sharp P where permanents are really extremely hard to calculate. Even in instances where just sample permanents, um, it's hard to calculate. And that's the idea of a boson sampling computer where you build a network with many beam splitters, which are arranged in, in different ways, but they all basically lead to photon interference where you see the bosonic nature. And you have now many modes, and you fill it up with, with let's say, with basically 70 photons, okay? And you have, let's say, hundreds of modes. And then you let them propagate. Then you actually always calculate by the photons itself, the permanent, they do it for free. They travel through and just interfere what nature says them to do. And at the end, you get output distributions here, which are related to the permanence. And this is so hard to calculate for classic machines, even when you go for a sampling, that if you be above 70 photons, no classic machine can do it for you. And that's the idea of boson sampling. So in my words, there's a cartoon here. So actually you, oopsie, so it was not my attention. So when you now, I want to start it. So actually, you enter now photons in integrated wavegate arrays. They should be all different. They should be like a, a complicated unitary, not just, not just identity. Then they propagate through, they interfere, and give you output results that are related to the permanent of the, of the calculation. And, and the, 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 the motivation to do it is just you want to. So basically, what you see here is basically uh, is the. The first car that broke the sound barrier on ground, this so-called SSC, supersonic thrust. And it was a stupid car. It couldn't turn left, couldn't turn right. It was just fast, okay? 
And, and it's, it said basically, yes, we can break the sound barrier on ground being on wheels. And so the premise is the same. Maybe not the smartest computation, but it says it's fast and it really allows to outperform classical uh, computers. And that's the spirit of um, quantum supremacy. So the idea of both the sampling started almost 10 years ago. The first group started with a few photons, including us showing, yes, in principle, that's the way to go. Uh, then we see it comes to first jump with 20 photons from this um, quantum dot source in China, where they send it in a big boson sampler, um, which they, are, where they still had, have to handle loss because 20 photons in, but never more than 14 photons out. You see six photon loss was the best they could achieve, but it was the right direction. And they did not manage yet to so show supremacy. Uh, the first one was uh, Google um, with superconducting circuits. Different architecture than boson sampling, but in the same spirit. They made this basically this, had this basically a uh, random circuits in there, and they showed first supremacy, claiming the computation is so hard. We used 53 qubits, uh, so hard it takes 100,000 years for computers to calculate this result. And fa fair enough, they got all the hype um, for the for the first performance. Uh, but technology goes on, know-how goes on, and now it was shown that. Uh, Algorithms got so good that they just need days, weeks to outperform or achieve the same computation as they did. However, um, supremacy is a moving field. And now the next big jump was that photons, 76 photons were generated in China. And they did boson sampling, particular kind of boson sampling, by using this kind of um, two dimensional interferometer, uh, where they achieved the state space much bigger. And therefore, complexity much bigger than what Google did two years before. They really say, well, we're so, so hard to calculate now classically. Really think there's no big gap between the classical computers. So now you might ask me, how do you achieve 50, 70 photons here in this case? Well, it worked in this particular computation because they did not produce actual single photons in the beginning. They rather took uh, Gaussian states, so called laser, laser like states where the single photon mass was given at the end by projecting here on single photon states. This works in this scheme. And this, in a very elegant way, allowed to implement effectively um, this 50, between 50 to 76 photon coincidences for, for photons that basically enter here to you know, hit a chip um, in this process. And here's a beautiful Chinese design you see this, this bark optics very well aligned, like, a, like a, I always show my group, that's how it should look like in the lab. Um, if, if there's alignment, and here's the chip inside, and they really did this heroic experiment, uh, which still now puts the benchmark on uh, what can be done with- Philip, with this is just a gentle reminder that you have about 13 minutes more, so you can manage your rest of the slides. Yes, you can go to the end, okay, good. Yeah. Good, then I, I use five more, five, five minutes to finish here to show um, what else can be done. So these networks allow the supremacy in speed up, but um, there are also way more practical application. And one thing that we think is important is security. Security is something that also quantum computers are allowed to do in a way that no classic machine can achieve. And I want to show you and also guide you then by hand through a secure computation that you see how powerful photons are even though it's about a simple concept in the implementation. So the, the last five minutes are dedicated to secure quantum computing, which merges the power of quantum computers with concepts from quantum cryptography, enabling blind quantum computing, where the computer doesn't know the input, doesn't know the output, doesn't know the processing, but still gives you all the power, something that cannot be done classically. Okay? And you can really imagine that if clients that control quantum servers, quantum computers, and they do, to, do tasks for you, but still don't know what they're providing here. And that's thinking of the globalized computer world, of course, a very interesting application with respect to data protection and security um, in the quantum internet. I see a question comes up. Um, so the question, there's a question coming up. Any progress meeting realizing classical quantum computing? Also, does the nearest neighbor entanglement requirement mean terrible scalability? No, 
because I showed you, you just need these few, these boosted gates. If you have gates where each gate has four extra photons, there's not much. You basically can fuse them efficiently and people work on those things. So people work on these gates, which are way simpler than, than the huge gates, gates with hundreds of extra photons. Um, and groups work on this, yes. And people try to find even better schemes and people basically try to optimize these steps right now for scaling up to cluster state machines. That's one way. People look at other totally new designs, including our group, to maybe find even more efficient ways to get cluster states. But I want to say um, base progress, not maybe that being visible by published papers, but I would say almost every photonic group dedicated to computing um, spends time in, in optimizing those, those, those things. Good. Time counter computation, um, that basically was the beginning 10 years ago. Um, and don't want to talk about this particular blind counter computation because it relies on cluster states and it was very important to have this. Um, I just move on now to, to basically how cluster states can be used also for secure computing. But I want to dedicate security also to feasible uh, special purpose computers. And that takes me back to these networks that we have shown before that are so powerful where you just easily can build these networks and do some particular tasks. And I want to show that you can, something also called random walk or, or just quantum walk computation because they walk through these interference networks to photon. And I want to, with you together, develop a secure protocol. So the challenge now is, so we do something that's called homomorphic encryption because now we allow the computer to know its processor, to know the unitary in there. But we just want to hide our input and our output. So we homomorphically encrypt our input data to be processed and then be decrypted. And that's very hard for classic machines. It requires a huge overhead, as you can imagine, to process encrypted data in a useful way. And decrypt is not easy. But in photons, it's actually something that's very elegant and can be done. So we are now Alice that wants to encrypt input and output, and we have Bob who knows what's in the middle. So let's do it together. So what do we need? What do we need to know? So we need to know that when photons enter such a network, when they be only when they be indistinguishable, that means identical, then they can interfere and come out, for example. However, when they be indistinguishable, sorry, when they be distinguishable, basically you have H polarization V or different frequencies and so on, then they don't see each other and they travel through independently. And at the end can also be separated easily by just using the polarizer if they are orthogonal or exactly distinguishable. And these are the two concepts that we need here um, that basically different photons don't interfere. So let's build our encryption machine now. So if it's a unitary, is the input. We want to hide that the, uh, these modes are empty. So we add now this first step from the other side uh, orthogonally polarized single photons. That's indicated by green. And now we encrypt them by rotating the polarization of both simultaneously to a new basis, for example, plus 45 and minus 45. But only we, as Alice, know the encryption here. Now we take the still being orthogonally polarized photons and let them propagate through here. And then when they come out, as it is the result from the computation, we undo the same rotation because we know what to do. And then we separate the HME by using this basic polarizing beam filter. And this simple encryption basically allows, in principle, when you have a big size chip, um, unconditional security, because by no means can Bob uh, guess the right basis. When I mean, he doesn't know the basis, he makes mistakes in measurements and jeopardizes the result, similar to the concepts of quantum cryptography. We did this an experiment with a small chip of four photons, that's a chip. We looked at different, uh, different outcomes. Um, and could confirm this encryption works nicely. Good. Um, actually, things stop here. So, how many minutes? Yeah. Then let me jump over the things I had not mind to talk. It's machine learning. It would go a bit too far. And then I'm restore and jump to the end. I want to just summarize here that in my eyes, um, photons have a beautiful future ahead. They're, they're useful for many applications. Um, I show just a few. Again, that's of course based on our group, but if you look to other groups that do other beautiful experiments, that we have access to linearities, that we have basically, we can implement easily secure computation, also benefiting from the photons can be transmitted, okay, and not only computed. Uh, I showed a simple example of this homomorphic encryption, that this is feasible with light, 
um, in lack of time, I did not manage to talk about our recent uh, machine learning results where we just got a cover page uh, last week, last month at the moment already. And I want to thank, of course, to all my group members where they really contribute to these beautiful results. And I want to thank you for your attention. Stay that long with me at this colloquium or at this, at this summer school. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for such a lucid and nice overview of the field. And the talk is now open to questions. Um, yeah, so uh, you are free to unmute and ask questions. Thank you, Professor Walter. I have a couple of questions. The first one is the following. Uh, it's been like 15, 17 years, but there is uh, no improvement in the length of cluster state in uh, discrete variables. But for continuous variables, we have like giant cluster states of like few thousand modes. So why not just think of, you know, um, coming up with a hybrid way in which we like explore some other degrees of freedoms of photons to merge CV and DV cluster state? And that's happening actually. So people consider uh, hybrid combinations, but it's hybrid is not always an, an improvement. Okay, so they're distinct, these are two different distinct architectures, each of it has its benefits. So it's correct that, the, that it's very easy and straightforward to get this um, squeezed light with the cluster states, but it's actually hard to get them out of the one dimension structure that just happened now that two D structures because 1D is not sufficient, and also to think of addressability and so on. So um, so if you look more carefully at the challenges that the squeezed light people have, um, they also face, face things that need to be solved to really allow at the end a perfect scale up, the same as the discrete variable guys do. So um, I would say still research. The reason why cluster states was not pushed straight forward is because the groups working on photonic quantum computing, including ours, were more interested in developing new concepts. So we also hop around. So we, uh, my first class of computation was done as a PhD topic 20 years ago, roughly, and um, a little less. And, and then, of course, we're interested in pursuing other directions and doing also like machine learning and see what else can be done. I think this, the, just, just the last couple of years, people focus more on technology to scale up the clusters that's here. And I'm pretty sure we'll see very soon dramatic improvements in discrete variable cluster state generations. Thank you, Professor. Just one more question. Um, this is regarding photonic quantum supremacy. Uh, recently, there was also another photon uh, supremacy by Zenedu, but both the times there was quantum supremacy, it was Gaussian boson sampling and not boson sampling. So do you think there could be you know, a way or in which direction people should go to prove something like non-Gaussian boson sampling? Yes, the answer. The other, so if you're asking, are there other architectures to show supremacy that are not based on Gaussian sampling? Is this the question? Uh, in photonics only, but not with like squeeze states and just with single photon sources. Yeah, yeah, they know that. There are a bunch of, there are a bunch of existing concepts about how, how supremacy can be done in the regime of all, over 70, 80 photons. So you can take cluster states. If you have 70 qubit cluster states, you make random measurements. That's also in the part of the task very hard to do. So there are other schemes existing that can be done, um, but just boson sampling was the, it's still very, extremely hard to do, but it was among those, it seemed to be more feasible, okay? And, and, and that was the, the reason why people go along this line, but I'm, I'm sure in a couple of years, you find other designs for supremacy. But supremacy, I think, has shown its, uh, shown its, its, its performance, basically its, its, its justifications. I think now uh, people should rather focus on useful applications or, showing what else can be done, okay? So I think supremacy, um, people believe that this is no problem, that this basically will be computed out performs a class solution. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I would like to pose a question. Yeah, I should uh, want Professor, to... can you please uh, uh, let me know why is it so difficult to generate single photons? I would love, I would like to know that it's nature. So all light sources that we have are not single photons. If you take thermal light from heating something up, that's highly non, it's not a single photon. You have vacuum and then it's this Boltzmann distribution. Take a laser light, there the photon number is not well defined. Basically you have the, 
superposition of one photon and two photon, three photon is a coherent state. So it's really hard to get a pure single photon, okay? And, 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 and the obvious way is, well, to give an atom, a single atom, where just one photon can come out at a given time. And that's at the end still the best way to do it. I see. Uh, thank you for your answer. So, so even, just to finish that, even when you, when, you, when you dim down a laser to basically have almost night, no light coming through, it's basically a state of coherently no light plus one photon and then some small term of a second photon and so on. So even a very dim laser light is not a true single photon source, okay? I see. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Any, anyone else? Philip, I had one query. I could help but notice that you didn't talk of any loss of coherence or decoherence. So in this photonic uh, quantum computing, is this less of an issue? Coherence? No. Yeah. So when photons fly, you have to be quick. So you generate them and then in fibers, you have to basically, before they crash somewhere, you have to measure them. So you build everything in fibers and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so here, the, the, the coherence itself is, is no problem. So the, the good, so the bad thing is the good thing. They don't interact with the environment, so it's hard to get gates. But it's good that they don't interact, interact with the environment, so there's no external coherence mechanism. You just have losses. So the main problem is loss of photons. Everything else is understood, and you can always compensate the rotation or an imperfect beam splitter. Then you know okay, the ratio must be adjusted. This is nice. So that's an advantage that we have the static contributions of noise, namely losses and static. Um, whatever misalignments of beam splitters or mis mis split, uh, not perfect splitting ratio, which makes it also easier for error correction schemes um, than, than sometimes for other systems. I see. Okay, thanks. So, if there are no further questions, so Philip, thank you very much again for this beautiful talk. Thanks. Good. Then, see you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>